Hello, hello, hello. Good day, everybody. Welcome to the stream. We are doing something a little different today. We've got, uh, we've got everybody's faces on here, and we've got a new face, one that people probably won't recognize. Pastor Mike, how's it going tonight? Good. How are you guys doing? Good to be here. Very nice. We're, We're killing it. We're doing well, We're yeah. Good. Doing well, yeah. It, uh, it feels nice to, to not be on the green screen for once. It, uh, whenever, I, whenever I have the green screen on, I have to wear very, very specific things so it doesn't interact with it. So honestly, this is, this is feeling good. How's, how's everybody else doing? We got Brad, Josh, and Sam. In, in here Hello. as well. How are you guys doing? Uh, I'm ready to toss some random text scrolling across the screen, chirping Brad left and right. I don't yes. know. Yes. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Ready to go. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. That is uh, five minutes. imperative. <laughs> um, so, the plan for tonight I mean, we're going to keep it pretty, pretty uh, lax, but we definitely want to uh, pick Pastor Mike's brain a bit. This was kind of one of the stretch goals that we had when we were getting donations for the Covenant House. Uh, it was actually suggested by someone in the chat. They wanted us to do an interview with a pastor and we were like, works out. We were planning on doing that anyway. So uh, worked out for the best. Pastor Mike decided to hop on. We tossed him the uh, a question of suffering. I thought that would be a good, good topic to kind of discuss through. But you know, we'll get into that in a bit. I think to start off, Mike, why, why don't we just hear a bit about yourself? I am... Um, both for the stream's sake and for our sake, you know. I don't know. I don't know how well I know you. We don't really know you that well, pers Mike. personally. What uh, what are what are some things yeah. you guys want to know about Mike? I guess I guess first off, like, what what got you into ministry or pastoring? Like, when did you feel that call? What uh, what what what's the story behind money. that? Money, hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Any, any <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in. Yeah. Yeah. No it's, further questions. It's dream, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> no further questions. Uh, yeah, just uh, no. I was. I grew up in the church, and uh, my grandfather, my father, uncles, all that deal was ministry. And very young, I was about eleven, uh, when I just felt this was the call, and so mm. then I just kind of pursued that since 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 then. Never got, kind of questioned it. Uh, when I was younger, I wanted to do other things. I wanted to be a judge at one point. Oh. Uh, I wanted to be a chef. Still do, to be honest. <laughs> Still love cooking. Um, good, but man. yeah, so I was young. Oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Um, and so just kind of pursued it. Went, went to college, got a job really young. I was 22 when I became a senior pastor of a church. Um, and that was a ride and a half. Did that for three and a half years. Planted the church that we're at now. So that's kind of the, the short story of, of, of ministry. I did youth hmm. pastoring, young adults throughout all that. Um, on the more personal side, you know, been married for eight years um, with my wife. Like we, we were dating uh, five years before that. So 13 hmm. years I've been with Emily um, and have three kids under six. <laughs> Olivia, Wes and Charlie. And they're great. Nice. They, uh, yeah, well, it's my little family my, and, and my little world. And we started the church that all of us now are a part of um, four years in October. So it's what, three and a half years now, something like that. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of the, the, the brief overview. I can get more in depth if you want, but that's that's the thousand foot view. Okay. Yeah, I, I got a question for you, Mike. Just yeah, I question, wanted to question in the chat from a little Sam. Yeah. your backstory there. Yeah, um, Mike. What part of the states were you born in? Which which <laughs> southern state was that? We can hear it in your voice. Uh, yeah, please explain. Yeah, it it was uh, Tennessee. Um, yeah. On a cold okay. midsummer's day. Wow, you remember? Um, no, <laughs> oh, Sam's doing that because midsummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Tennessee. Uh, so. Um, yeah, apparently I have an accent. It's what people say. I, I have a drawl. Um, it's true. I, I had like college professors tell me that like I should stick to anything Southern American with my like communication pattern and stories that I want to tell because I just fit with that. It was quite annoying, but it's <laughs> I, it, I, there's no reason for it. I have no idea. Um, I like when I was young, when I was really young, I actually had a boss Bostonian accent. 
it was it was just this weird like little thing that my voice did and then as i grew up it went it just went more south the older i got the more south it went and now it sounds like you know i'm full on um, i've had i've had people ask if i'm from virginia texas georgia um i've had people ask me like my immigrant story and and how how do i end up here uh, people assume that i'm theologically american sometimes because i'm american in my in my sound it's, it's, it's been quite it's been quite a at times an asset at times a uh, liability so there, there there there's that okay i will say my dad my dad who tunes in uh to some sermons here and there he did ask the exact same thing <laughs> he asked if you're from the south so i think i think it comes through a bit more yep. in your preaching i think uh I think when you're really getting into it, it just, yeah. Just when you out. get more animated, Mike, when you get more animated, that's when the hmm. southernness really comes out. <laughs> so I'm preaching. Uh, I guess, and I guess what you. What can I do? I can't control it. I've tried. <laughs> Never change. Never change. Don't listen to the haters. Um, you kind of mentioned it. You you mentioned college, Bible college. Tell us. Uh, tell us about mm-hmm. that. Yeah, um, I grew up, so to make it more interesting, I grew up Pentecostal, if any, anyone of y'all know what that is, the PAOC here in Canada, oh, yeah. and uh, there was a you know, five-point Calvinist college that was right by my house, um, and it meant I could stay local and continue dating my now wife. So I went to Redeemer University down in, in Ancaster. Uh, did four years there um, and studied, yeah, basically why all that I grew up with was wrong, according to them. Um, it was a big bulk of the theological training um, and ended up, you know, somewhere in, in the middle, not quite, you know, old school Pentecostal, definitely not Calvinist or Reformed. And yeah, then I, the funny thing is I planned to do seminary, um, but I ended up, like as I said, getting a senior pastor job right out of college. And so then that kind of became the on, you know, the on the job training, we'll say, and everything else has just become, you know, continue reading and courses and things like that. So that's how, how that all lined up. Very nice. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think Sam's the only one in the chat that doesn't have some sort of Bible college degree under his belt. Um, I am. I am. I'm the least theologically literate of this entire group. <laughs> I mean, and yet the most theologically sound, which is incredible. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> if by theologically sound you mean most similar to Mike, um, then then yeah, yeah. Oh, I was so. including Mike in that. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, you've really risen above. You've really uh, quite the uh, rags to riches story. <laughs> um, True. Everyone loves an underdog. <laughs> you. Uh, I guess, Mike. Uh, on a more more personal note, what do you? What are what are some hobbies or things that you enjoy? You kind of mentioned cooking. I'd say, like, aside from like ministry, mm-hmm. aside from just like strict family stuff, like if you have a day to yourself with like no worries and stuff, you can go out with friends or do whatever. Like, what what do you think you would spend spend your time doing? Well, you know, for a dad of three kids, that doesn't exist. <laughs> So um, let me just dream for a second. No, I think, um, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Like for me, mainly, it actually is doing things like this, around chatting for a while about philosophy, theology. I love, I love doing that. Um, cooking, as I mentioned, like barbecuing, mainly. I try, I try, I'm getting into like over the fire cooking. So like build, building a fire, getting to the right spot, cooking. Like it takes nice. it takes a whole afternoon if you're gonna do it right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I do that. Uh, basketball, I love basketball. That's kind of my sport. I played it growing up. Um, watch it when, when I can. Um, right now, obviously if, you know, I know you guys, I don't know if any of you guys are actually, you know, basketball people, but um, you know, hoping the Suns win this year, that, that would be great. And yeah, I know I like, I like comedians. I do like watching comedy. Um, I think that, that that is fun. Oh, burn them! But it's hard for me to watch. I did, I did, I did watch some of that. I'm not that you know online right now. I'm you know recommending it in any way, but I did, I did partake. Um, and 
Yeah. So basically, I'm I'm not very uh, I'm not very complex. Play basketball, cook some stuff over the fire, and talk about Jesus. Like that literally is a good day to me. So, you know, nice. That's what I enjoy. Who's your favorite comedian? Favorite comedian. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, the one that I I like watching um, a lot. It's kind of lame. Well, it depends. Some people think it's lame. I actually really like Jim Gaffigan. I like Jim Gaffigan. I like his food, his feud, food humor. Uh, I, I relate to that a lot. Um, and I will admit, I really, um, I really enjoyed the first half of Bo Burnham's new Inside Special. I haven't watched the second half yet, so I can't give any commentary on that one. Um, but and then I just, I just go through different YouTube um, like comedy. Um, like just just the videos from different sources and and, and to be honest I kind of like it because it, it also is it's, it's almost research for me because you're seeing people on a stage capture someone's attention for minutes on minutes on minutes and so it's almost some education for me so it's it still is sometimes work, but I enjoy it. It's like I like doing it, so I, yeah. I kind of sample why. Nice. See, I think we got some Bo, Bo Burnham fans in the chat. I think we all, oh, yeah. we all enjoyed the new special. I followed him for a while. He's a solid dude. Um, Josh, are you you're a, you're a basketball fan. You're probably the most basketball esque I, of the four of us. I, I'm bas I'm NBA aware. Okay. So like I I'm not actively following any like obviously I'm gonna hype the raps, but like and I know like I know enough to have a conversation about it really, yeah. but like yes. it's not gonna compare to baseball. Thank it's you. It's not gonna compare to even hockey, but yeah. Nice. I I could definitely talk a lot more about cooking. That's for sure. <laughs> and comedy. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Any other Brad? Brad, you're kind of into cooking. Sam, I don't know what, where you're at in the cooking thing. I'm just starting to dip my toes. Yeah, personally, I think right. cooking's I think cooking's a good thing. It's definitely a okay. it's definitely a positive <laughs> hobby. Like no one's no one's gonna hear that you like cooking and be like, oh, flip it, eh? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this guy. What a waste Imagine of time. Mm, food, get that out of here. Um, Imagine people responding the same the way they need to video games. <laughs> Okay. Four hours cooking. I made a really <laughs> great. Always. Made a really great meal with my wife tonight. Yeah. Was, uh, also made this man. She made some chicken breast with uh, mushrooms in a sour cream kind of sauce, and then some nice. asparagus. It was just a wonderful kind of late spring sort of meal. Nice. How do you guys feel about yeah, asparagus? Awesome. I grew up not liking well, asparagus big, at big all. Asparagus I'm pro. Guy. I'm pro asparagus. Definitely, definitely has some aftermath to it, but you know, it, uh, it's worth it. I think we're a pro just... asparagus church. Like C3 is <laughs> I, I think we can put that <laughs> under the beliefs and values. Yeah, so Mike doesn't have to answer that one. <laughs> publicly, he does have to take that stance. Uh, I, I only, pro, had, pro I only had asparagus. asparagus. Yeah, I only just recently had asparagus cooked properly. I grew up with food not being cooked properly, which is also why I love cooking so much, is because once I learned how to do things properly, I realized it wasn't horrible. In what sense? Like, that just man. everything was burned? Everything just was undercooked? Like, No, just... everything's boiled. Oh. My family's from Newfoundland, dude. They, th they throw everything in a pot, and you just get that. Hamburgers? No, not hamburgers. Okay. I'm not Brad. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, shots. <laughs> I don't boil uh, hamburgers. Why does it? I've just I've just gotten into stir fry lately. That's my cooking uh, expedition. I can barbecue a few things, and now now the stir fry, the vegetables, dipping my toes in that. I like it. I like it. Broccoli, you know, top tier. Grill, or toss that in a pan. Get some soy sauce or something on there. Let's I, I go. Think, I think bean sprouts are a very underrated but essential part of a stir fry. I He's definitely a big bean sprouts guy. Can't confirm, but bean sprouts are good in general. <laughs> you, yo, 
You guys, you want, want to hear a, a sin confession? I don't think I've ever told this to anyone before. You seem way too high. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you're, you're coming really into this with a weird attitude. Right? I don't know. I don't know if I want to endorse to this. I, I, I used to work at a grocery store when I was in high school, right? Oh, no. And Same. one of my responsibilities as a stock boy was to put away the grocery, like the, the produce every night. So I'd have to actually like go out to the bean sprout tray and bring it in and put it back in the freezer. And like almost every time I would definitely like grab a, a I'd pinch some, some bean sprouts out of the tray and just, just nibble on them at the end of the day. No one ever, and no one put ever them back on the shelf, no right? No one ever knew Sam. Come on. Next day. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Somebody knew. God, I was really, yeah, I was really hoping it would have a twist, but like every day I walked over to those bean, <laughs> bean sprouts. Committed murder. Walked back. <laughs> nice little twist. Um, hmm. Not proud of it. Do you like bean sprouts? Do you like pho? Can we, just, right. can we just call it pho? Mike, are you a big pho guy? Yeah. Can we just... I am. I mean, I'm, I, I'm gonna call it by what it's called, you know? <laughs> can can we just call it pho? Come on. <laughs> what a dumb name. I'm sorry. Do you say quesadilla, or do you pronounce it <laughs> properly and say quesadilla? No, I say quesadilla, but that's because it's not no. a dumb name, you know? Can we agree it's there's some word. objectively dumb names out ironically. there? Can we agree on this? happening right now. <laughs> sorry, Mike was talking about how he likes pho. Let's just let him... What was that? Just let him have this. But yeah, 100%. 100%. Oh, yeah. Bean sprouts, great. Actually, I, I, I make this, like, what I call uh, a street food noodle. And okay. it's, it's it's inspired by like a, a white man's pad thai is what I call it. And it has okay. I did it last night and put some bean sprouts in there, give it a little extra volume. It was it was extra excellent. Mm, excellent. I love pad thai. <clears throat> we gotta have a cookout. I like I'm gonna have so many church guy. cookouts, man, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. It's great when you make it yourself. I went and got tamarind and made, you know, tamarind paste and did the whole deal. And it's 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 great if you actually know how to do it. It's wonderful. Yeah. Nice. That's the key with foods. I Even know what tamarind is. Know how to do it. You know, know what tamarind is. And when I, when I said that, that I I thought that was someone's name. You were using the paste. <laughs> it's, it's just a very sour paste that's like gives pad thai its act. It's like its uniqueness. Okay. Yeah. Regardless. Yeah. Nice. The secret sauce. It's kind of a secret. Yep. Yeah. Mike, I was I was thinking about this today, and I wanted to ask you. So when when we get like some sort of space, and we inevitably host like some board game nights or something, if you were sent an invite to something like that, what would like what would run through your head? Would you be on the side of like, oh yeah, you know, could be a fun night, eat some snacks, whatever, or would you be more on the side of like, I don't know what the heck like I would do, doesn't sound like much fun. Or, like I'll go for the community. Oh, the first thought would be. Gave him permission to use the space. <laughs> Just kidding. What are you They're doing here, Daniel? Yeah. Uh, no, I do. Three a.m. It's just problem. me. The thing. The thing is, I the the you know the more our community grows as a church, the the less and less I'll probably play games with our church, um, only to protect myself because I get very competitive, and you know a few of the early days. Right when we were launching a church, we did some game nights, and you know some people saw that side of me, and you just gotta you guys gotta roll with it and recognize that, you know, some people can handle their pastor just crushing them in a game, <laughs> some can't, and some can't, and so that right? sounds like sounds like a bit of a flex oh. right there. <laughs> You're gonna come in and crush everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, not gonna lie, that's a that's a big flex. No, I, I like I like I like board games. I like. Uh, Catan, those strategy games. Um, I don't really play a lot anymore because I got kids. So kids yeah. like card games. They like go fish and you know like matching games and things like Lame that. Stuff like that. Yeah, we got this one called the Enchanted <laughs> Forest. You gotta like use fairy tale characters and find different treasures in this board game forest. So we so we do that one. Which hey, if you guys want to do the Enchanted Forest like that, that is the game. Um, you know, you perfect an expert, really an expert in. <laughs> He knows all the strats. Yeah. <laughs> pretty good. It's it's a you know it's an age range four four to eight man like just crushing it. Does your competitiveness come out with your kids? <laughs> Is it one of those things where like you kind of give them a chance, but then at the end it's like you made the wrong moves, pal. 
Uh, well, it, yes and no. Like, I think um, when, when like, one of my children, I, w I won't name them, um, but the, the eldest one, um, <laughs> when, when, when they get hyper competitive and start, like, cheating, I'll, mm. I'll like, turn it on a little bit to be like, like, this is not how we win. We, we want to win by actually, you know, giving our best and doing what, what, what we need to do. But like, you know, I, I grew up in, in a home with, there was three other brothers, so there was four of us and then my dad that was there. And like, you know, always feeling like you can't win sucks. <laughs> so, gotta kind of yeah. allow a kid to get some wins and, and learn how to do it. And you just gotta watch, right? So like when, again, when there's some, you know, mixing the rules up to take an advantage of, then you gotta kind of, you know, that's not how, how we do it. But overall, like, just try to be a good dad. Let them win. Take one for the team. Right? Coward. Absolutely. <laughs> I like that, Mike. <laughs> now, no, Mike, man, hey, we it was Father's Day yesterday. At our, we had a Father's Day service yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I, you had some strong words for the men that you self-censored. But now that there's less people watching, is there anything Ooh. that you would like to say? Because, hey, this is a gaming stream. It's a lot of young men watching this stream. <laughs> anything you want to say yeah. to those young men that you uh, didn't want to, didn't get to say in front of newcomers <laughs> to our church yesterday? Uh, interesting. Uh, well, first I'd say go watch the, the last 20 minutes of the sermon. Well, watch the whole sermon because it's all about Jesus. But... The last, you know, 20 minutes where I right. talk about it all. Uh, no, what, what, one of the things I was telling Sam this last night that, like, I had this whole part about these young men wasting their money on OnlyFans and that they need to, like, grow up. But I self-censored that during the sermon because I figured either someone would be like, I don't know what that is, and then go look it up, and then, like, you know, you cause some issues. You cause them to stumble, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Right? But it's, it's ridiculous. Like, guys, yeah. guys are spending 25 bucks a month it like like i don't like you need to get a life i'm just saying like if that's where your money's going right to the exploitation and objectification of other women whether you call it empowerment or not right like you you are funding the degradation of a woman to nothing more than your pleasure and so to even put the label man on you at that point is 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 not is not right so with that does that, does that fit sam i'm glad that i'm glad that, that this is out there now people can come and hear you say that we'll clip it we'll clip it <laughs> get, yeah, get anthony to insert it into the sermon <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Next time. no that's good we uh i at some point we're definitely gonna have like a whole night maybe even like more than a night dedicated to like porn and like lust addiction all those things i think that would be a good topic i think it's very uh a very good topic for for the audience of uh of twitch and gaming i think i think the two are interlinked in a lot of ways um so no that's good thank you for the uh, the uncensoring of that this is the right the right audience to do that for i agree sunday morning service <laughs> probably not as much but very good awesome do you guys have any got other kids in the room sometimes yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> you guys have any other questions for mike before we kind of Open up the floor. I, or Josh, could you? We could set up like a Nightbot command to have like the sermon, the sermon link too. Yeah. Um, I think I have a link either right beneath the stream or if people click on the Who We Are tab, it should. There's links on that page to uh to the church sermons and stuff. So <clears throat> the resources are there. Um, yeah. Any other any uh, other general about, questions? From what a sweet location we were at this Sunday. Oh yeah, oh, this is wild. Mm. That was that just it was a straight wedding venue, right? Like they they use that as a like a wedding reception venue, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, be there again this week, and Nelly's preaching. Oh, really? So excited. Our boy, Nelly's son. Well, in the heck, chat. Can you say anything? I Leah had told me that he was preaching soon. But yeah, he didn't say anything in any of the numerous group chats we're in. So we'll, uh, we'll have to start pumping that out. <laughs> uh, Sam, are you preaching again sometime in the next couple weeks? I think Leah mentioned that. I do. 
Yeah, I'm going to be preaching on July 25th. Very believe nice. also potentially at that location. We'll see. But oh, yeah. okay. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. All right. So in the chat, if you do exclamation point Mike Sermon, <laughs> it'll send the link to the, the sermon from yesterday. All right. Well, do you guys want to get into it? The, uh, I do. The, the topic... Oh, well. The topic that I chose um, is the topic of suffering. I think we've we've talked about it a little bit on the stream. We've never really like dove in, dove in that deep into it, but um, yeah, we we've definitely brought up like I'll probably mention a few things that I've specifically remember mentioning in the Dovin. past. But I don't know, Mike. Do we want to? Do you want to take the floor for a bit? Maybe talk about some of the things that you you talked about recently. I can think of. Like two weeks ago, you talked about it. I remember a sermon from like months and months ago where you talked a lot about suffering. It might have been one of the ones, one of the few weeks that we were like back at Dune and in between COVID stuff, maybe. Sometime at Dune, I remember at least. But yeah, do you want to? Yeah, it's definitely come up. I think, I feel like Mike, you address this whenever <clears throat> you do an apologetics series because it's definitely like one of the main objections hmm. people have with religion in general, but definitely Christianity in particular. <clears throat> Um, my big question is for you, Mike, um, does, is the fact that it, 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 this can be the way that you jump into it. And I'm asking this a little bit tongue in cheek, but is the fact that we in the West have it so good mean that God's favor is on us and all those people in Africa and South America and South Asia, just God doesn't love them as much. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. Um, well, even even that question, right, is, is so loaded because <laughs> arguably the fastest growing regions of Christianity are in all those places. So it's the blessing, right? Technically, you could argue the opposite is true that we're under the curse of God for the church being destroyed. But um, that's not for tonight. Uh, suffering. So the question, right, is is one, yeah, that especially online, atheists, uh, materialists, secularists, like, like thrown out as the... Um, the chief, right, object, uh, like uh, objecting to, 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 to faith. And, and it used to be called the rock of atheism, the idea of suffering and evil. Um, and I think in many cases it still is. People still rely on it as the biggest thing. And, and, I, and I think it's fair. Here's the thing that I think Christians have a weird time with is it's, it's, it's un... It, it's just dishonest to say that, like, suffering isn't a big deal. I think Christians don't try to try to downplay it a lot when it is. It is a big question, and we need we need to honor on, honestly honor that in in our atheist friends and in those who suffer greatly. I think the bigger question, though, and, and this is is I think what I interpret even the question of tonight, right, is how how do we as human beings make sense of suffering? I think that's a that's the bigger question because it's not just really on the Christian to defend the presence of suffering. It's also on the atheists to explain it. It's on the Buddhists to, to explain it. It's, on, it's, it's on, the, on the Hindu to explain it because all of us have a worldview that tries to make sense of this, right? And, and to me, that's the ultimate question is who explains it best or who, who, who addresses it in, in, in its fullness? And I would argue that Christianity does that more and more than anything else. And so the sermon that Daniel's referring to just a few weeks ago um, I broke down five reasons why Christians say that suffering exists in in our world. Um, five origins or five causes um, that 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 exist in a world that that God made. And obviously, the first one for us is the world has fallen. Um, that's just the reality of the nature of the, of the world. So, if you're not a Christian, then you might not believe that. But to me, it's hard not to believe. That. And if even, even even if you're an atheist, you still look at the world and say like this is broken, right? Something is not quite right here. Um, so that's the first one, right? The world's just broken. And so sometimes our suffering is just simply um, because of the current state of the world, um, which we do believe as Christians is broken by sin. So sin causes all this stuff, but not personal sin. This is a difference between Christianity and, and karma, right? Karma says your personal suffering is your fault. S simply, right. right? That you're paying off karmic debt, that that's what you have to deal with, which, by the way, like is an absolutely atrocious idea that human beings have invented that karma 
like it's, it's actually one of, i think it's one of the worst religious ideas that that, that we have ever made um because because we use it so hypocritically we use it to justify so much craziness um but whatever but in the christian world what we say is that sin um sin can have a a sin can have a um, a power to cause suffering in, in my life, but not in a karmic sense, not in a paying back sense, just in, in, in an act of consequence. So if I, for example, right, break trust with my wife, right, that's going to cause issues in my marriage, right? The bad decision led to a bad, a, a bad um, consequence. And so the same thing happens in our life where we sin and it causes issues to exist in, in our world. There are moments because we know that God is good, that he disciplines his children. So he will allow certain amounts of suffering into our life um, and it's what, you know, even, even James has count, count it pure joy. Paul and Peter both write about how suffering causes um, our character to grow. That there are, There's actually good that God bring, brings out of it at times to train us up in the way that we should go. And in fact, you, you could even argue that one of the issues of the modern world um, is, is that we have gotten so used to comfort that we don't know how to suffer. And therefore, in a lot of times, we don't know how to grow in certain ways. Um, and so, so something that, that, that God does in us like that, then, um, we are often, um, we, and, and then this one gets tough, but we are often the victims of other people's sin, right? Like this is a real reality of the world. We make evil decisions all the time. We hurt each other and, and we destroy each other. And this is, and this is the one that I think people really have a big issue with. Um, if you're not a Christian, because the question becomes, well, why doesn't God stop someone? Why doesn't God, you know, alter someone's freedom? Does God desire that evil to happen? And, and that's where you start getting into the idea of God's passive will or active will or his desires and his declarations. And, and, and is God a God of freedom or not? Because I don't think anyone on this call, at least I would hope not, is a pure determinist that just believes we're just dancing to the fates or dancing to our DNA whether you're an atheist determinist or, or a spiritual determinist, right? That God gives us freedom because freedom is better as a just objective quality than the non-freedom. And so people use that freedom to destroy. People use that freedom to sin. And, and because of that, we suffer in, in, in many different ways. But what we know as Christians is that suffering in that sense is never undealt with, right? This is something that, this is where we, we, get, we, we begin to ask the worldview questions. Well, how, how, how does someone who doesn't believe in, in God just in general, deal with the fact that there is genuine suffering that seems to go unpunished, right? Because for, for an atheist, what happens? Well, like, you just, you just die and it's too bad, right? Or can you even call it bad? This is the thing that the people don't get, right? Is that, is that when we begin to talk about suffering and evil and, and what happens in our world, right, we ground that in the knowledge that, that this isn't how it should be. There, there, there is a shouldness. There, there is an oughtness that, that we compare it to. Where, you know, if you are a materialist, there is no oughtness. There is nothing beyond this that, that actually sheds light other than some kind of human-based ideal, which we would agree with as Christians. Yes, we want that, that ideal, that justice to be there, but we would then have that in a higher place that gives us those, those definitions way more clear. We can dig into that in a bit. So then there's the victim. Then, then there's the, uh, we believe, you know, we, we are not materialists, so we, we do believe in supernatural origin of, of evil and suffering at times. Um, be it because we love Jesus in persecution or, or, or torment, right, or, or um, oppression, or be it just demonic in, in, in its nature, that there's actual evil in the world that is influenced by the demonic powers. Paul calls them, um, you know, authorities, rulers, and principalities, all these kind of like territorial, um, almost almost like hierarchical structures of, of evil and and that they work against the people of God to delay the day of the Lord. And and here's the thing, is like we even see this in Jesus, right? Is that is the cross becomes ultimate place of, of suffering in that all powers, right? Demonic power, state power, and religious power, all ultimately influenced by demonic power, come against Christ to try to destroy the, the, the Messiah. And it was by the hands of the state, right, under the influence of the religious leaders, ultimately through the, the power of, uh, of the enemy to destroy him. So we see them working together. And then lastly, it's mystery, right? Sometimes we just don't know. He, Christians, Christians should always err with humility. We, we don't know certain things. And, 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 our, and our theology doesn't give us the permission to say that I know everything. 
to say that I have all the answers. And in fact, I think this is where a lot of Christians go, go wrong, is we, we feel this necessity to try and, 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 and make sense of everyone's suffering, but we can't. I can't, I can't bring that up and try to like give every detail. And we have this almost like I need to defend God or need, I need to defend this person. Like, like at the end of the day, I, 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 there, there's things that I will never understand because it could be a combination of everything that we've said, just the fallen nature of the world, the sin I've done, the sin other people have done. Maybe, maybe there's some demonic things happening. Like, like we just don't know. And we, can't, we have to be humble enough to recognize that, you know, our world is, is far bigger, it's far more complex and our immediate understanding of it. This is something that G.K. Chesterton, I think, brilliantly said, is that for us as, as people who um, are, he would have called them, you know, uh, spiritual or, or non-materialists, or we, we believe there's more to, than just the material world, our, our, our ability to see the world is so much larger than the atheists, or so much larger than the materialists, because we, we don't have a cap on what could be true and what could be happening. And so we just have to sit there sometimes and say, you know what, like, there are things that I do not know, and... I, I'm not going to try to sit here and explain your suffering to you because, like, I can't do that. But what I can do is what? Weep with you. What I can do is know that all injustice will be met either at the cross or before the throne of God. Like, I can live in that and believe in that. And I can sit in with that. And, and, and that's where, like, Christianity, I think, actually offers a, a, a genuine approach to suffering that doesn't reduce it. That, that, that doesn't make it an illusion, that, that doesn't make it just this cold, that, that actually brings something bigger into it. So that's, that, that's where I think I would begin with that. Like, obviously, there's a lot of nuance there and a lot of things that could be taken, but that's how I would start, I guess. Whew. Very nice. Let's, uh, yeah, that's good. Let's, uh, let's unpack some of those points maybe a bit more. Um, so... The first thing that you mentioned, so you mentioned five, I want to say, five different different mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first thing you mentioned being the fallen world. Um, let's get into that a little bit. So for someone watching who like doesn't really know anything about Christianity, how, how would we go about kind of explaining what that is like with talking about kind of like sin um and its effect on our world what do, what do we what do we think would be like a good way of going about um describing that how how how, how would you guys do that to someone? Ooh. The old Uno reverse card. Well, very very nice. nice. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Uh, I yeah I think. No. Um. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry, I was just my mic is my mic is like behind your guys. I'm pretty sure. So I think you're hearing delayed audio. Anyway, um, the way I describe sin is just like like that is kind of how we make sense of what's wrong with the world, and so that obviously goes back to our origin story of um our creation our creation myth if you will of the garden of eden um and not necessarily myth as in it's not true but myth as in like this is the story that we use to to make sense of of the world um and so so sin is what's wrong with the world we we and we believe that we as um we as human beings introduced that into the world through our own free will that god gave us um, but there, there is not, we aren't just condemned, we believe, to, um, uh, being ruined and being, uh, yeah, being condemned to eternal death because of the power of sin. Like we believe there's actually an antidote to that. We offer hope of that. Whereas, and I think that's probably the, if anything, the unique, the unique value proposition of Christianity is that we offer a, an antidote that is also something that we don't earn, something that we uh, don't have to go out of our way to perform rituals and appease gods and, and merit on our own behalf. Like, we, we offer the story that um, this, the, the debt that we owe is too great, that we could never appease that, that debt on our own. And um, 
that God himself came down and paid that debt on our behalf. And um, like that, which is, which should be the best story ever. I just think, I think oftentimes human beings don't often deal with the human beings can't accept that grace so easily. Human beings want revenge. They want payment. Like you see this all the time. We live in a world right now that is particularly unforgiving of past sins and past uh, offenses. And it, it definitely, it, 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 there's something about that story that actually rubs the human human nature the wrong way that we that um we we maybe have to wait till after this life for for justice to be enacted but um i don't know i that was a bit rare that's that's to me just like that is the christian story that's 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 sin like we that's the framework with which we view the world um i don't know mike what do you what do you think of that did i did i totally bungle that or did I do a decent job? Well, I think you told the story well, 100%. I think, I think how we make sense of what sin actually is in its nature, it's harder to nail down, right? Because I think the reality is that human beings will never escape a sense of wrongness to the world. Right, and I think that's where, where where we would begin to make headroads with people who aren't Christian to make sense of it. And so, yeah, in our creation myth, I like I like how you said that. I think it's beautiful, right? P- people get Christians are so afraid of the word myth, and I don't understand why. Right, our, our our understanding of how the world, the great story of, of of our world, right, begins right where God makes everything good, calls Adam, and, and and when sin enters it, what's interesting, right, is you have you have Satan, or you know the snake, uh, or the 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 divine being right represented in the snake come to them right and so already here's what's interesting think about this already sin was present in creation by the presence of the one who rebelled right and so so sin was there in satan's heart right and what was his sin his sin ultimately was pride it's he wanted glory he he wanted he wanted god to to share god's position Right, he wanted to be 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 the chief, that, and and that's why a lot of theologians say that pride is the mother of all sin, right? Because it's the first thing. It it it, it which really means the lack of humility is is the is the mother of all sin, right? But sin then becomes right, literally, right? It's missing the mark, right? It's the it's the archery. We have you ever been to like a Bible camp or you've got a track? Right? Sometime because some guy with like big ball b- bottle glasses and suspenders gave one to you, right? It's probably something about how like sin is missing the mark and, and it's true, that's literally what it means. But it's this idea, right, that we at, at multiple levels rebel against or in bondage because of um, ultimately the law of God, that we, that we don't want to follow his ways. Like when we talk about the fear of the Lord, I think that that's actually an interesting place to begin with sin because the fear of the Lord um, Proverbs said is the beginning of, of, of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And so, to, the understanding of the fear of the Lord is to understand rightly who God is and how He relates to the world, and then therefore how I relate to the world. Right? And so, when I no longer fear the Lord or revere Him or understand Him as He's meant to be the King, the Creator, the Good Redeemer, right? And I choose my own path, right? That, that was the big issue. Satan chose to break the order. He chose to try to go above God. He tries to go out, out rank. Right? When human beings try to break the order and say, God, I'm, I'm the arbiter of truth now. I get to judge you. I get to tell you. Right? That's when things begin to break down. God, you know, even the whole creation myth, right, is God creating order out of chaos. God creating order out of nothing. He's bringing these things to be. He's, he's architected the world. And, and just like in, in a building, if there's one thing that, that gets out of the foundation, right, the whole thing can collapse. And this is what sin ultimately is. It's the corruption of that. And what, and what it begins to do, um, and, and, and there's debates theologically if sin is a force, if sin is just a, a negation, if sin is just a, this. The, and, and regardless of all that, right, sin, when we sin, right, we've chosen to deny the right way of God, to deny the right worship to God, to to deny his proper place. This is why Martin Luther said, if you can just obey the first commandment, the rest will follow, which was what happened to other gods. You can worship God truly as he's meant to be worshiped. The other, the, the other things begin to follow. And because Christian, or because Adam and Eve didn't do that, 
um, sin, as Paul says in Romans, right, through one man's sin, right, sin, sin entered. And, and there's this idea that then sin begins to, um, some would say corrupt sin. Calvinists will say total depravity. I'm not necessarily a total depravity guy. Uh, I'm more of a, of a complete brokenness guy. And the, the language there is because I think that human beings in the common grace of God do want good at times. People actually want, I think, good. The problem is, is we we are unable, broken in our nature by sin, to continually choose the good, to choose what is right, to go towards that things at times. And that's why we need Jesus. He is the ultimate champion of the good. He is the ultimate redeemer of all those things. And so sin puts us in this place. It breaks it down. And then sin, I think, then leads to a bunch of other stuff. So sin separates us from God. It, it breaks us from from that place. It, it leaves us out. And then it begins to lead to specifically, you know, break down. In, in four fundamental ways. Breakdown between us and God we talked about, so I'm separated from him, which is why I think Sam's rendition of the story is beautiful, right? the great redeemer comes. But it also breaks down three, three, three other ways, right? It breaks down between me and myself, right? This is where we have the, the disintegration of the person, right? Sin, sin causes issues in me, right? Be them, you know, personality issues, be them fears, be them anxieties, be them worries, be them whatever. Like there, there, there's a disintegration that is here. Then there's the relationships, right? Sin breaks down society, right? It begins with Adam and Eve, and then it goes out further. In fact, even in, in, in Proverbs chapter, I want to say eight, seven or eight, where, where um, Solomon talks about the, the six things the Lord hates and the seven he thinks are an abomination, and, and he talks just about breaking down a social order, destroying justice, destroying your neighbor, lying tongue, planning evil, right? It's this idea of breaking down between human beings, causing injustice, not treating humans as they ought to be treated, which is, I think, a very beautiful definition of justice. And then it breaks down between us and creation. And that's why Paul says creation itself is groaning for the day of the re revelation of the sons of God, because on that day, all things will be put back right. So sin doesn't just break down me and God. It begins to break down me and myself, me and relationships, and me and, me and creation. And, and that is the infection. It's like that disease, right, that, that goes and just spreads out. Um, and so, you know, that's why we say the world has fallen, right? Not because the trees sinned, obviously not. That, that, that's, a, that's not what we're saying. It's saying that the world and, and the way it operates, the way it functions, and the way it ultimately was meant to be unified in this place. Like, what people don't often understand is that the world, that the way that we see the, the story of the world was it was meant to be Edenic in its totality. Right? That as we developed and as we went out and we made cities, like we see this Edenic, which would be this idea of the, the presence of God and, and, and the creativity of God and, and him with his people, that we, the family of God on earth, would just represent him and there there'd be shalom, peace, and whatever. And, and, and that's just been broken down. That doesn't happen. And we see it right in human beings. We do these things. Like, like it's, it's very hard to look at the world today. Um, no matter who you are, whatever lens you, you, you see the world through and think like, yes, this is definitely the way it should be. Right? Mm -hmm. And as Christians, we trace it all the way back to, um, right, to, to ultimately that fall, um, you know, and, and, and then, you know, subsequent human decisions past that, obviously, like that, that, that affect things. But, but that's why we would say the world's fallen. And that's what, and so, and I guess that was a really long answer to probably a short question, but no, you can explain all good. that. I, uh, yeah, I think the, the explanation of like what sin is, like sin's a word, I feel like in culture, like everybody knows the word. I think a lot of the time it's used in kind of like a joking way, but I think it's, it's easier to explain than maybe like, like a lot of Christians think, or like maybe Christians are kind of worried to talk about it. But I think deep down, pretty much anyone you talk to would agree that there's something wrong with people like the world is not this perfect place there's something wrong within people maybe they won't say it about themselves but in essence and i think most people would also agree that most people are selfish in some way at least those are two things that i find that people will often agree on and um and i think sin is jumping off of points like that i think it's pretty easy to uh kind of explain what sin is and in the worldview of a God who <laughs> set up things yep. uh, with a purpose, with a reason, deviating from that has led to... Well, yeah, except 
except if you deny the reality of objective truth, right? Then what is sin? Sin is 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 poor preferences, right? And so there, so like, I think we, I think we have to just recognize that this is a bigger question because oftentimes when people joke about sin, right, they joke about it in the sense of like just doing something wrong, right? Well, that was a wrong action or a wrong thing. And usually wrong means breaking social convention. Maybe mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, a basic moral principle or something like that, that, that we would ground not, not even in objectivity anymore, but more in, you know, social contract or utilitarianism or something like that. Whereas Christians, we, we, we do take it a step further. There, there is an objective ought to the world, right? And the ought is, is, is like a, is a duty. See, this is the thing that I think we have to recognize is sin for, 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 for the human being, for the Christian, is... I, I like I'll say this. I think you're right, Daniel. That it's simpler than we often think, but it's often it is often more complex as well because it's not just doing what is wrong, right? It's also not, not doing, doing what is right, right, mm -hmm. right? and it is it, it it is rejecting God for who He is. So so what we begin to see now is I think like I, I would put it like that, and I might need to develop my my. Um, my, my theology on this a little bit more, but the way that I could put it simply, I think, is this, that sin, most obviously, yes, is doing what is wrong. But then from there, well, who defines what is wrong? Well, we would say that well, God does. But then on the other side, right, it's also not doing what is right, which is the same question. Well, who defines what is right? Well, we say, well, God does. So then ultimately that third point of actually not treating God right is the source of all this, because when we think of sin, we also can think of it think of it as either the plain rebellion. I know God is what he is. I know that, that, that God, you know, is king or whatever. I'm just not going to do what he wants me to do. Then there's the, um, you know, reduction of God, which, you know, basically recognizes that God is there, but doesn't treat him with honor. So it's not even like I'm angry and rebelling. It's just like, I'm just, don't, I'm, I, I'm apathetic, mm -hmm. right, towards God. And that, and that is a, a form of sin as well. And then there's the replacement of God, right? That actually define God differently. This is the modern issue, right? That, that we want to name God as we want him to be. And so our sin flows from the fact that we don't actually recognize the nature of God anymore. And so therefore, if, if, if I get to define everything, then, then, then sin literally get, get, gets reduced in many conversations, whether we explicitly realize this or not, but to simply like cultural preference, like mm -hmm. cultural moment. And so that, that's where like, it, it, it can't just be what is wrong because for us, us five guys, we might have, we would probably have a very general, I would hope Christian framework to guide what those terms mean, right? Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is even in culture where we might not agree on the objective nature of wrong or right or whatever, um, I was listening to a, a pastor the other day. He mentioned that there, there, that a psychologist that was studying kind of the language, like that we've got rid of guilt in, in cult, culture. We, we got rid of shame in a lot of ways, yet we still find it in us. Like Christians and non-Christians alike still carry a, a, an emotional sense that like something is not right. But when we've, but here's, and, and this is crazy. And this is why I think it's so beautiful about the Christian story and why, like, whenever people say, like, why do Christians always talk about sin or whatever? It's because if, if we don't have sin, okay, then we don't have hope. Well, this sounds weird, but just go with me for a second, right? Because if, if I can't say that there is something wrong with, with my actions or my things and, and, and like, the, the fundamental issue is just, it's just me. Like, I, I just have to figure this all about by, by, by myself. There's something wrong. There's nothing right. Then, then I'm actually locked in a state of perpetual brokenness with the instrument of fixing the thing that's broken itself. If I can have sin and recognize that, that sin means I've broken a law, or I've, I've done something against God, then now I have a way to be fixed. I have a way to be free. I have a way to be forgiven, right? That, that doesn't exist outside of that. And so I actually think like sin allows us to better deal with our internal sense of guilt and shame at times as well. And although at the surface, it makes us feel maybe immediately worse. Cause like I've had people say this to me all the time. Like, you know, like people don't like being called sinners. Well, of course, duh. Like who would want to be called that? But if, if we don't recognize that there is this thing in us, then then the Savior becomes even less. 
And so I think we have to just recognize that as well, is that sin comes the way that that when we that when we're exposed to it and we see it for what it is we actually find there to be not so much condemnation but the pathway to mercy and and when we remove that it actually leaves us in condemnation just for we're, we're, we're without a savior because we still feel it human beings still feel it yeah yeah a failure to like properly diagnose the problem um just leaves you more confused for sure like hmm. that state of a lot of people are just in a state of denial i think um through no maybe through no fault of their own they've been taught wrong but like if you can't diagnose the problem correctly which is sin then you'll you'll treat it with bad solutions i guess i think that's what kind of what you're saying there mike yeah and and like i think what happens is is two extremes begin to happen is we either get kind of like the fundamentalist view that like every issue is sin and like you know there's no room for mistakes in life right sometimes we just screw up because we make mistakes right? this is where this is the fallenness right it's not like my fault it's just like i'm part of broken and i just do broken things right i've been wounded so i wound or whatever like I'm, there's no intention to hurt right where sin right is pride is selfishness it's living itself out and and usually if we're going to be honest and, and, and like raw we do mean to do our sin we we do choose in a moment not to give what is right or to withhold what is good or whatever right and so i think that we just have to like recognize that that there are times where we can just say things are broken um but then the opposite is also true that, so the fundamentalists say everything's sin, but then, but then there's like the modern progressives, which will say everything is is sickness, right? And and we're just all we just need cured, and usually curing is is simply like today is simply just go get therapy and, and deal with it. And listen to me, right? Like I think therapy is great. I've been in counseling; it's just wonderful. But it's not the cure all, right? If if we begin saying that 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 sin and and wrongdoing is just this this you know curable disease through human intervention right we also lose something there because it, it makes who gets to define then who gets to define when you're healed right? and, and especially if we begin treating like major sin simply as just sickness we get to this weird place that maybe the state defines when you're healed or not and therefore they could define your freedoms after that point or but if sin becomes a, a act of the will still if sin is simply an act of the will Right, that I chose to do this, and then I can take the punishment for that. I can deal with that, and then I can go to Christ, and I can be forgiven of that. If I'm always just sick, like and so, that's why. Like I think it's 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 not either or, which I think is the tension. Like I've talked to you guys. I think at least Sam about this. I don't know if I talked to you guys about this, but like I think one of our biggest issues in modern theology today, at least I see it, especially online, is we don't like tension. Right, so we try to resolve tension by going to one side or the other. Where the Christians like, no, what? Guess what? There's sin. There is sickness. It's both. And it's discernment that helps us figure out what what this is, right? And, and we have to work our way into that stuff. And at the end of the day, even if, even if, like, ninety nine percent of what you do is simply because of a brokenness that is in you, un, unchosen by you, undesired by you, but there's that one percent of sin that still exists. That one percent still matters because it's still a, it's still an affront against the infinite. That's what people don't understand. Like sin. Is 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 an offense against inf in, in infinite good. That's why it has infinite consequence. Not because, you know, like, kind of the, the atheist rhetoric that like you know this temporal sin has you know eternal. No, it's not actually about that, right? It's about that which you're offending, the the infinite good, and and so like we we need to deal with that. And so you know sin is a real issue, and we have a real savior. Sam said it beautifully. Right? It's the best story. It's honestly the most redemptive story that, that we have um, to deal with the pain of, of our life, um, which is like why even as a, as a pastor, it's, it's, it's still just like, it's, it, it isn't cliche. Though it sounds like it, it's not cliche for me to say like this is like the best story that I've heard, the best hope that, that, that we have. And, and, and to me, I'd be foolish um, to, 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 to not want it to be true. Mm. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, Mike, I wanted to maybe spin off something you said a little bit. Um, what? And, and maybe this goes in a slight, totally different direction. I don't necessarily want to get into the topic of hell tonight, but we're talking about suffering. The hardest question I think I've ever been asked as a Christian, it was by a friend of mine who had suffered with depression quite a bit and, and even suicidal ideation. And they were like, like, Sam, do you believe that um, if I commit suicide that I'm going to go to hell because, you know, I've sinned and that I'm going to suffer for all eternity because of that? And I like, I like just didn't know what to say to, in that moment. Like, you know, that would be pastoral and like sensitive to the fact that they had gone through some very real suffering, even ongoing stuff that they needed help for. And that, like, they think that they saw the Christian response to their situation as being, you're going to hell because you suffer and mm -hmm. can barely deal with your life anymore. Like, what, what would you, where would you even begin with that? Samuel, that, that, that is a question. <laughs> um, that is a question. So, there are many many different aspects to, to, to this question because it's not just a straight yes or no heaven hell answer, right? Because like for a long time, like I think I, and I could be wrong on this, but I don't, I don't know if it still is in the Catholic church, but suicide and it, it was in the Catholic church, like basically a cardinal sin. Like you're just, there's, there is no, there's no hope for you if you choose that. Um, yeah. And, and so that would be the Catholic answer, right? Just, you're, it's, it's too bad, right? Um, and and in and there have been many Christian writers over, over the years. Um, Augustine, I believe, in the City of God, addresses suicide. Um, I know G.K. Chesterton talks about it. Um, and the general Christian, The general Christian approach has been in history, I, f I find, to be more along the lines of it, it is this sin that is a maximal offense to God that you would you know, choose to, to, to not only... The way that, that uh, Ch Chesterton said, it, I believe, was that it's not, it's, it's not that you are murdering the self, you're murdering the world because you're, you're ending everything at, at that point. And it, right. in... And, and so I think in some in some cases that might be true, um, that there is a, a selfish act that is in great defiance of life itself. But yeah. I say that as a theologian. Okay, so is there a possible situation where someone could do that and it would be a maximally great sin or whatever you want to call it? Maybe. I'm, I'm sure you could. I'm, I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure there's been moments of, of that. Um, but I would also say that, and this is my theology, and it might not be in line with, with, with the historic, you know, Catholic Church. Although I'm also a Protestant, so like, there's a lot of theology that that, that I don't hold. So, um, would be that grace, grace is bigger than my ability to sin. And so what I mean by that is, is, is not that I get to do whatever I want and bank on the grace of God. Of course not. Nowhere in Scripture allows us to do that. But in my whole heart, as Paul says you know, multiple times, right, believes in Christ, remains fast to Christ, holds fast. Like if I'm in that saving relationship with Jesus and in a moment of great uh, distress, mental illness, brokenness, whatever you want to call it, I made the decision. I think there is grace for that. Of course there would be. I have to believe that. Because here's what I would say, right? What is, and this might be so, so I don't know, typical modern, you know, Christian, but like, you know, I, I want to make sure I, I'd say it as is properly, but um, sin, like the sins I commit I'll say it like this, right? The ultimate sin of 
prideful disbelief, that is the sin that sends me to hell. Rejection of Jesus. All other sins right, flow from ultimately that one sin. And so would I say that someone goes to hell because they're greedy? No, they go to hell because they reject Jesus. It, someone doesn't, you know, under judgment um, simply because they just did a bunch of selfish things. They come under judgment because they did a bunch of selfish things while remaining in disbelief. That's the thing. Like, the only reason why you and I are not judged before the Lord is because we have come to put our faith in Jesus. Like, that is the defining factor. And so if I believe that theologically for salvation, then heaven and hell will ride on on simply my acceptance in the confession of faith in Christ. And and so that is the gospel, the good news, that, that I, I'm no longer judged. Now, does that mean there are that all sin becomes flattened? Well, of course not. There are, I think, greater sins and worse sins, and we, we need to deal with that on that side. Um, but that's why I could, I think I could honestly and rationally argue, given what we know today about depression, about mental illness, about anxiety, about the brokenness of the human mind that, that is, is, is in very much in line with the brokenness of the human body, that if there was a situation where someone, you know, wildly depressed and, and suicidal and, and end up taking their life I, I, I don't think the answer for the Christians is like well no hope I think like every other person that ever existed the question is did they love Jesus or not and, right. and, and if in a moment of, of sheer weakness or call it whatever you want there was a, a lapse into great distress I, I have to believe mercy would meet that person I have to believe that right. um so that's my answer as a pastor. So as a theologian, suicide is a grave sin. 100% it is. Like that's, that's always been the church's stance. To, to take life justifiably is always a sin. Um, as a pastor, I would say that I think, like, I think that you'd have to be very careful how we apply that to situations, right? That we have to be discerning and, and know that, like, yeah, that, that mercy, I'm just, I've been, mercy has become such a bigger thing to me of late. I know it sounds weird as a pastor, but like the, the, the depth of God's mercy, the beautiful nature of God's mercy, the overwhelming nature of God's mercy, that if we just think upon it, it's really hard to think that for someone who has loved Christ, who desires Christ, who wants Christ, and because of, of a moment of, um, you know, a season of depression, a season of whatever you want to call it, mental illness, the mercy would also be taken. I just, I just, I just can't, I can't, I can't see that based on the theology that I believe in about everything else. Um, so, yeah. so that's how I would delineate. So theologically, yes, it's a grave sin. We need to like, it's never the Christians. It's never the Christian way. Yeah. But so many other things that we do are not the Christian way. And so I'd still say there's mercy um, in those, in those moments. Right. So really like you would, I guess it should be no more offensive to say that you're going to hell for committing suicide um, if you didn't believe in Jesus than it is to say you're going to hell for punching your baby sister when you were six because you don't believe in Jesus. Like, it, it, there's there's really not a difference between the two. The, the question is your heart and, and your, your your salvation based on your acceptance of, of Jesus and your love of Jesus. That's that that is how I would I would argue it. That's how I argued it in college. I, I had to do a presentation on this for one of my psych classes, and that this is the perspective I've had um, since then. In fact, what's interesting about it is I um, honestly before that presentation I was the opposite. I was more Catholic. You know that in all cases. It's just, it's just a grave sin, and it's kind of like the greatest affront against God. And then I started to read some theologians. I started to read, you know, just different perspectives on it. And I just ca I came to the conclusion that although I agree theologically with the, I agree with the logic of the Catholic Church. I agree with the logic of Augustine. I agree with the logic of, of Chesterton. Um, I also think as a, it, now that we understand some some of the nature of things that it's it's hard to it's hard to not see the the depth of brokenness that exists in that moment and then not respond to it in mercy 
So, so yeah, like I, I, I'm, I would go on public record like we are right now and, and, and say that theologically it's sin, pastorally there definitely will be mercy for those who are in Christ. And, and yeah, like I think, I think the issue is that it's a sensitive thing, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it, it feels cheap to compare it to other sin in some sense. Nonetheless, um, you know, and, and even you could ask the question, well, like, you know, did God want me to go through all that? And it's like, well, that's where we go back to the five things I said, right? The five causes of suffering in the world. There's brokenness and it's part of life. There, there is sin that we do and there's woundedness from others and that all contributes to things. And God knows, God knows how to weigh all of that. That's the beautiful thing about, about God being who he is, is he's the judge of heaven and earth. Right? And, his, and his judgments are always just. That's what the psalmist says. And so we know that if we stand before him, we'll be able to weigh out and delineate between every single um, issue, whether it's personal sin, brokenness, someone else's sin, and he will be able to judge rightly what is before us. And, and so I think, I, yeah, I just, I, I'm not Catholic in, in, that, in, in that sense of like just pure hope. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate I, that answer. Yeah, I have like there's so many things that have been said since the last time I spoke that like <laughs> I've been taking notes on certain things that I think are like really interesting or stood out to me. But um, uh, when talking about sin, like I, I mean, this is coming. I'm gonna preface this by saying uh, I will place myself as the resident expert. I did teach archery at two different Bible camps, uh, so I am the resident expert. This man knows about sin. missing the mark. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on, relax. Uh, but like, in, in even in terms like, if I even in that last question, when I'm thinking about it, um, I like, if I'm thinking about missing the mark, in, in like a, if I wanted to get it, like, yeah, the, like it's a very sensitive question. Um, if I'm thinking about it theologically, I'm not ordained, so I have to answer the pastoral side of the question. Um, but theologically. Um, missing the mark may, like means you didn't hit the bullseye, but it doesn't mean you're off the board. So, like, if if we're approaching sin, I'm trying to like create an analogy that I could. But <laughs> like, this is a free one. You can take this one. Uh, shooting, <laughs> going to an archery range and missing the mark, not hitting the bullseye. You're still on the board, but not missing the mark but not having christ in your life is like not bringing the arrows at all like you didn't you don't have a chance so like right, and it's right. it, at that point it is up to god like he is going to judge like i am of the belief and i have the stance of ethic that i mean certain actions are sinful within their context like if you're if someone tells you not to do something and it's very gravely important you don't do something and you do it no matter how innocent it is in another context, that's still you're not you're doing something that's wrong. Sex, um, another great example of that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Some context. I'm just well, saying, like, yeah, one context, yay, yeah, one context, yeah, yeah. nay. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it, it's a it, hundred. And I, yeah, and I'm of the belief that sometimes there is something that is typically understood to like traditionally seen as this is the worst opportunity and. To preface, I'm specifically not speaking about suicide in this scenario. Uh, but there are certain things that are understood, at, at least culturally, to be wrong, but in certain scenarios are the right move, are the correct thing to do. That is what is right. And like to, to get back to what Mike was saying about objectivity, is that there is a difference to that. When we're talking about culturally, um, there are certain times when the wrong thing is, what what is perceived culturally to be the wrong thing is the right thing. And that's the hard part of it. Hmm. Um, I have, I, I did, we like to get it back to suffering. Um, we went really hard into it, but we didn't, uh, we didn't set like a standing definition of exactly what suffering is. Do we have like, Mike, did you, when you were writing your sermon, did you, for, did you like set out like, this is, this is the definition of suffering that I'm going to go off of. And I once taught at camp about growth. Uh, and then I got to the end and someone who was a leader there who wasn't, very who was very new in their faith said like like i didn't understand what you meant by growth in the beginning because like even that word which is a normal word was used in a christianese kind of context in the way that i was speaking they're like i didn't really get it like mm -hmm. growth with god was didn't they didn't understand that to be like the 
whatever. Hmm. So like, did you have like what was what was the or is the definition of suffering you think you would use? For that sermon, I was going off. Uh, I kind of preface at the beginning with the idea of the personal suffering. Like, why do I go through hard things or bad things? Or why am I chronically pain? Because it was a sermon on, on a man born blind. So a man was born, no choice of his own, suffer, become a beggar. And back in the day, that's happened. If you had some kind of disability, you were just kind of, it's, it's hard, hard society. Oh, it was a hard culture, much different than, than what we have today. Um, and so the question of like this man, right? No choice of his own, born blind, um, he ended up having to be a beggar um, to, to make mo money. So he was poor, blind, and, this, and the disciples walked by and asked Jesus, is this man suffering? So impoverished, begging, blind because of sin in his heart or because of his parents? And Jesus said, neither. So that idea of personal suffering. So I'm personally going through things that I consider to be maybe unjust or, um, or in some cases evil. Um, but I think, I think evil and suffering are not the same thing. I think that's a huge, a huge point to make. Definitions of that do matter. Evil, um, some suffering is evil because of its origin and nature. Some suffering is brokenness. Um, some suffering is, is self-inflicted. Some suffering. So I like. So you're right. Like the the definitions do do matter. For that sermon, I was going off the idea of personal suffering. So I have experienced some form of pain or um, I think pain is, pain itself is, is even a hard term, but some kind of dis, pain, discomfort, um, in, in injustice in my life that I consider maybe even um, fair or you know whatever. And how and how do we deal with that? Because that's you usually the question, right? And so the the idea was I was trying to answer a question like why am I experiencing this thing that I don't like right now? Why how, why hasn't God you know given me something better or whatever? Which is a very subjective question, obviously, right? Um, so that that's kind of the question I was I was dealing with as I was thinking about that. But, hmm. I hope. Yeah, I, I think even the word like the word is subjective when you're talking about suffering. Like you're talking about when you when you're main when you're saying belong what uh, the my understanding is prolonged pain like a repetitive pain something that is ongoing uh, or for a certain amount of time but even that amount of time is subjective but yeah um like for myself mm -hmm. like i i am someone who experiences i i have chronic back pain from a car accident that i had no control over i was in a back seat um but i don't consider myself suffering i don't experience that as suffering it's inconvenient it hurts, it's uncomfortable every day, but it's not something like in my head, I don't consider myself to be suffering, whereas someone else would experience that as suffering. And that would be something that would, could actually, like someone else would experience completely differently. So, yeah, there's, when I, when I yeah. And it, that's, I think that's another big difference between suffering and evil as well, is the difference in levels of subject, subjectivity. That's good. Well, we would argue that, but culture wouldn't, right? Because what mm -hmm. what is evil to a relative is a culture, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. So that, that 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 is like a foundational key thing in this discussion is that we have objective grounds for certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And and even that question, right, of of what is suffering to me might not be suffering to you. I think is a very valid question as well, right? because. We, Valid in the sense that I think it's interesting to dig into why that is. What is the condition of the heart, of the mind, of the soul, of the community that allows me to overcome in that sense, right? right? To not see it in, in that sense. Or why haven't, why hasn't Josh become a victim to that moment? What, what yeah. has happened? What has been the, the narrative there? Which I think that that's actually a very powerful question to ask. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I feel like suffering, yeah, I can't really, it's hard to place words on. I think most people would just consider it like an extreme version of kind of what makes it like pain and discomfort, I feel like are kind of two factors of it, but everyone just kind of, that word suffering just puts it to an extreme in most people's minds, but, huh. Um, I guess. Well, and a lot of people in, in this discussion, though, usually think of extreme unjust pain. Hmm. Like when it when, when it becomes like theological object um yeah obje objecting to, to god right 
then it's usually like you know the unjust suffering of a child right mm -hmm. or the um you know unjust death of some person or a tsunami or something like this that like why would god allow this thing to happen and that is a legit question but in that case like i wasn't necessarily de de dealing with that because that is like logically right christian philosophers would say that that question has been dealt with right if if we can think of a morally sufficient reason if we can believe that god could have at any level a morally sufficient reason for allowing any kind of suffering that he can be justified in doing so right which is completely emotionally unsatisfactory but like philosophically it, it, it works out so i wasn't dealing with that because that because i think once people use it more as a bridge just to kind of like just to it's it, it's not re the real question uh, but the personal one because i've had people ask me that as a pastor like like why why am i in this i think i just think that that's a more real question it's a more mm -hmm. honest one because like me being a compassionate human being of course cares about them person i don't know suffering but like when i bring it into my own heart like why am i having to go through this and that that that, that begins opening up some of those other conversations that i don't think we often talk about enough I like that you you mentioned the word justice, and I think that is a huge, yeah, a huge aspect to it of usually when people are getting tripped up by it, it's that idea of justice of like not seeing how this could be worked together for good. And it's actually, it's something that I brought up at Connect Group this past week. I forget what question spurred it on, and this is going a bit off track, but I've, I've been thinking a lot lately of just about the idea of justice and I guess like maybe the obsession that I can have, and I'm sure a lot of people deal with, of like wanting to be the arbiter of justice in like most life situations. Like when you are slighted, when you are wronged, like really having trouble moving on from that without wanting to see justice done to that situation. Like even just like in little ways, like at work, if someone's slightly rude to you or something, like you want to be doing something you want to be like making it known that you were hurt or like making sure that they you get back at them in some little way like i feel like yeah it's going a bit off track but i i feel like with suffering that's that's a huge aspect of it because we can you you kind of touched on this this is something i was going to bring up of something that i always think of and that helps me kind of work through suffering is you're talking about it with the philosophical way of thinking about it a bit of like i know times in my life where I have felt like I'm suffering and it's going to sound really corny. The one that always comes to mind was like a really bad breakup. And like, I just thought every, all of my life plans and stuff just were thrown out. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was like, this sucks. And I don't see like a good way out of this. But then in hindsight, you look back on it and you were like, Hey, I didn't, I knew nothing then. And now I can see the good that came out of it. And I'm so thankful that I went through that to get to here. That's like a very little, very minute thing. But it's like, I see how God can work through mm -hmm. that. And I can wrap my mm -hmm. dumb little mortal brain around that. So like, I can have faith that an infinite God in control of everything can work that kind of thing out with tougher situations that I don't understand. And like you said, like not the most satisfying answer sometimes, but yeah, that's the least the least emotionally satisfying answer. That that helps me in a lot of ways. Well, yes, but that's also like I think it, it Romans eight is real. God works all things for the good who are in Christ, right? Hmm. And whether we think that's cheap or not, that's the promise. So that has to be at some level a thing that we hold to as Christians that God will work this thing out for good. Right. Now, where I think we need to understand the implication of that, right, is what does good mean? So, you know, in, in, in Daniel's case, right, God takes this breakup and gets into this place where now he's here. He's, you know, with Leah now, and it's great. He's loving it. But it would have happened, whatever, right? So we see good, and we can do that. But, like... Jesus says, or, well, I guess Jesus, yes, through, through Paul says this, right? Like, this is a promise to his people, right? That, that when life um, is not as we hope it to be, because it is a lot, right? 
God will be at work in his people to bring about good. And good must be then defined by God, right? And so as Christians, this is where we get, I think, a little bit ripped up. And, and why it's not emotionally satisfying in many, in many different ways is because we think good means material gain. Right? That we think good means peace in my life and prosperity in my relationships. And I'm going to meet the perfect girl in this case. And, and that's just not... I, don't, I just don't believe that's what Paul was talking about, right? The ultimate good is that we are found in the hope of the resurrection, right? Philippians, you know, chapter 3, where he talks all about how, you know, he counts everything else as rubbish, but that he is to know Christ. That is the good. That is the maximally good, great good that we have, is knowing Jesus. And so knowing that God will work this suffering out to bring me to be, in some sense, closer to Jesus, knowledge of God, more like him, living more in the life of God, like that is what the good will, will ultimately be. And although it doesn't answer the question of, you know, like, you know, why great injustice happens, I understand that there is that promise that allows us to not be overcome by it, right? The, the, and, this is, and this is key about, about all things. Like, Daniel, you, you mentioned, like, about justice, and, and having justice and meeting justice and making sure everything is fair, right? Which is a great impulse, right? But we all know life isn't fair, obviously, right? But as a Christian, what is our answer? What, what is our response? And, and it's this, that God uh, before the throne, right? There will be perfect justice. And just because temporally I don't feel it doesn't deny the reality of perfect justice in, in ultimately my, my life. And, and so that's where I can, I can be blessed though I'm meek. I can be blessed though I'm merciful, as Jesus says, that I can walk around and, and turn the other cheek because I know where vengeance lies, it lies in the hands of God. And, and, I, and I can be free from the desire to have to make everything even now because God will, God will take care of it. And either those who offend me, those who cause my suffering, those who do injustice, right, will um, find their forgiveness at the cross that I did, or they will find justice at the hands of, of a mighty, in, 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 in a real Old Testament sense, awesome, terrible God, right? where, where justice will cause fear. And, and, and so I think we just have to recognize that it, it's, when we say things like as Christians, like this is going to work out, we can't, we can't continue to mean that this season of, of, of darkness is going to mean your deliverance in the next one. Like, what the heck does that even mean, right? Or like, you know, we're going through a season of breakthrough now, and you're going to, what do you, I, I, I like, it's, I think we just. So that, that bothers me so A lot much. of seasons, a lot of seasons. Yeah, because like, <laughs> yeah. Because cause it, it, does, it does feel like every time a pastor says that, and they mean something like a, an immediate material good, like, like I actually feel like I'm being ripped off. Like, I, like, I feel like that, that makes me believe if I was going if I was a new Christian like that would be such shaky ground to build my faith on I would mm -hmm. risk losing the, the little faith that I have because there's a great chance that I'm not going to find God's goodness immediately satisfying like you know what I mean like it, it's not because it's not going to be what I want I want things that are actually the Bible would tell me are sinful for me or bad for me. Like being rewarded with material possessions that I idolize is bad for my soul. Like, mm -hmm. but, but I feel like it's so easy. And I don't even think that a lot of, a lot of preachers probably don't even mean to say this, but the way they say it will leave less theologically sophisticated individuals, new believers to believe that, he's talking about material good he's talking about a new house a new promotion and, and i mean some of them are very bald and do say this like joel osteen will say that promotion god wants that for you like you know what i mean like mm -hmm. they will they will say that kind of stuff but um well because I think here's that, the thing like, though sam a lot of yeah, is it, yeah. it's not necessarily untrue because right? oh, God yeah, want, it's not necessarily right? untrue yeah Sure, so God, I think, I think, I think God wants. There is yeah. a tension there, right? It's just, it's it's recognizing that like, you sold people, sold people a sufferingless Christianity, and the guy who founded it 
died on a cross. Yeah. Like, that just doesn't work. Hmm. Yeah. I we think, could go off on prosperity yeah. gospel all day. I mean, I think I think a lot of worship songs oh. kind of do the same thing as what you're saying, Sam. Where they might not explicitly say those things, but a lot of the time, what can come across from them is is that same idea. Um, yeah, it. I'm trying to trying to kind of reel it back in. I think I I uh, I, I want to talk about justice more. I don't know. Justice is just been on my mind um but yeah i think the ability to surrender that need for justice to god absolutely hard um but uh a real real good thing to do i think that's uh yeah it's real hard to uh real hard to surrender that but and then the other kind of like funny part of that is how many times have we been committing this injustice to others and not realizing it? Like, obviously, we're going to notice the times when uh, when other people slight us in little ways or we perceive things like that. But how many times have, have others perceived that of us? Um, hmm. Well, I think... That's uh, real talk. Yeah, I, I think... And this is the the I think the inherent tension is desiring justice is not wrong. Making justice is not wrong. Hmm. Right? Having biblical justice live in our life is not a wrong thing. The issue is when justice begins looking like vengeance and and our heart is actually motivated by bitterness and not righteousness. And I have not met one human being that, in all honesty, can say that when they are offended, their first impulse is justice, not vengeance. And hmm. I could be wrong, obviously, but I know that even in my own heart that like a lot of it is like, I I I want to want to be even. Want them to know how I felt, right? But we but we are what we are the ones who love our enemies. We we are the ones who forgive 70 times seven we are the ones who like when i brought up blessed are the meek right the ones who jesus says are blessed are, are, are the ones who are often <laughs> looked over right and it's so countercultural. um but i recognize that i'm in the act of vengeance um i cannot love and that's huge like like that's i think a huge thing we need we need to realize is when i'm acting out of vengeance against the person at starbucks who ticked me off right um i I can't love them in that in that same state i'm not going to be loving and want vengeance on them and i think that's the call of 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 the kingdom is that we are we are loving towards those individuals and yes here we today the kingdom is not weak in the sense that it just lets injustices societal injustices tyrants go without being called out and, and spoken to 100%. Um, you know, the kingdom has 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 its power in, in many different ways. But on the individual level, right? Like, it's it, it is a a uniquely Christian thing to recognize that I am not, as Daniel said, the arbiter of justice. I, I'm not that, and um, I want to be a doer of justice. But then, what 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 does justice mean in that sense? Justice means I think, um, you know, treating human beings as they ought to be treated, right? And so if, if, if in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of being offended, that's more of a, a judicial justice that I need to, you know, treat this, this act as it ought to be treated. And the thing about it is, like, human beings are, are never... The reason why laws are good are because human beings are rarely objective. And, and, and sometimes we need something bigger than us to help us see a, a thing clearly. And, and so that's where like, I, I can just see us having to give up our desire to be the executioner of justice if it means that I, I will be living a life of bitterness and vengeance. 
and being uh, and being humble enough to delineate those two things because that, that is very difficult right because we feel justified in our in our hurt in our pain um and 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 lex talionis right the, the the eye for an eye of the old testament right um is was a really good principle right it was it, it was a great um thing that god had ordained and used and whatever but for us as christians in, in a new kind of covenant stand i think that there is there is a, a a move of mercy a move of vengeance is mine says the lord in the book of hebrews that allows us to take what jesus says as you know forgive your enemies and bless them and actually like live that out how how do you forgive your enemy right and we're not and like and not talking about like the person who cut you off at work they're they aren't your enemy they're just having a bad day like our call is forgive our enemy bless those who persecute like that's the call of the christian and so that's the high level and that begins to delineate itself down and so you know it's not like we don't go stick up for ourselves if someone you know you know robbed you of hips at work it's not like you don't say anything it's like hey th there was an injustice done we don't want to seek vengeance anymore and i think we have to do better at at holding those two things apart if that makes sense hmm. definitely um something else all that right boys what else yeah i wanted i wanted to touch on and i think it maybe ties into what you were saying before sam um is the idea of suffering how do i phrase this as not as a positive thing but like what the good that can come of suffering i mean we have paul mentioning uh, the paul mentions that the idea of rejoicing in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance endurance produces character character produces hope and I think it might kind of tie in with what you were saying before, Sam, about the idea of people wanting to be the deliverance from suffering. And you said it too, Mike, of like being material good or like being just uh, like the straight opposite of whatever this suffering is. Um, but yeah, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of talk about rejoicing in suffering and what, what, uh, what we mean by that. Well, I think a key distinction is that we don't rejoice um, at suffering, but in suffering. Hmm. Right? Like we don't like suffering. <laughs> That's not how the world was made to be. But what we don't, but what we do is we is we can rejoice in it, in spite of it. That's why, you know, in in, in Luke's version version of of the Beatitudes, he says, you know, blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are those, you know were poor and then he compares it to the woes the rose on the rich the rose on the on, on the well-fed and it, it was a, a comparison of value you know jesus was setting up this new ethic right that that we can be blessed even when we are poor or even when we are mourning even when we when, when we're not laughing because we are part of the kingdom and so 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 there's this bigger thing going on right that our blessedness doesn't hinge on material circumstance that doesn't mean material circumstance doesn't matter of course of course like we can make prosperity happen for people like why wouldn't we do that it's it, it, it's good we want to care for the poor we, we want to you know bring prosperity to where we can like it's a good thing um but it, for in personal suffering right like we recognize that that suffering is almost a discipline of our faith because what it does is it humbles me to rely on God, to be in God, to depend on God, and to find, as, as you read, Daniel, those character things being developed. Like, I think, honestly, part of the reason why, like, we, we started this whole conversation about men. Remember that? And Sam wanted me mm -hmm. to, you know, uncensor myself a little bit, right? Why do we think there's so, like, I'll say this carefully. Like, what is one of the factors that that lead us to 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 have um you know so many just young guys with no vision and no passion for life it's because it's because and this sounds maybe weird but it's because they're not suffering enough it's because we're so comfortable 
right? Yeah. That, 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 that there is no mountain to take there. There is there's nothing there, and so we just kind of literally spend our time on on sometimes endless pursuits. And here's the thing: it's it's not a bad thing that we've built a, a society where there's less suffering. Of course, that's a good thing. But when we get so comfortable that we don't even know how to give our life to something like that, is a problem. And and, and like I much I would much rather deal with that problem, of course, than than you know, our suffering uh, uh, of the past. But I think there is a real thing there that when we when we as a culture are afraid of suffering, run from suffering, um, it, it does create a, a certain sense of um, potential moral weakness. It's never been tested. It's never been tried. And we're 25, having our first real bout of suffering in our life, and don't know how to deal with anything. And, like, I, I say that tongue in cheek, obviously, um, but but I, I do think that that there is this 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 fear of suffering when God does use it. Like I know that the greatest moments of my growth have been through suffering, like just yeah. hands down. Like like I I've never met someone who said to me, you know, the best times of growth of my character. Or when nothing was ever wrong. Never had that conversation. And maybe there are people who feel the way that they grew the most when nothing was ever difficult. But like, I just I just don't see that uh, as a real thing. And part of our job is to recognize the world is broken. There's suffering in it, and and I need to be somebody who's carrying myself, my family, you know, the faith, the church forward through this thing. And. And, and that produces in us some character and that produces in us humility. And I think the biggest thing is humility, that we depend on other people, that we depend on God, that we recognize I'm not the center of the universe, that I'm not as strong as I think I am. I'm not as smart as I think I am. So therefore, I need other people to help me in this. And, and I think that actually creates a very powerful position to be in, um, that, the way that God can redeem suffering in, in, in that sense. Now, we don't wish suffering on, wish suffering on, on anyone. Um, but God, you know, he definitely, he definitely, I know that's my experience. Maybe you guys have had something different, but. Can't no, I'd agree. I, would... I feel like Jordan feel Peterson like... agrees with that stance <laughs> from his one book. <laughs> oh, I have so many thoughts again. There's so much to chew on in this conversation. Um, I feel like when, like, when you were just talking about that again, I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking of suffering. First of all, I'll get this out of the way. Is it suffering when you're talking about, like, we don't rejoice, like, su sorry. Yeah. We don't, what was it? Sorry, what did you say at the beginning? The, the difference between the two. Celebrate suffering, right? We don't, yeah, we, yeah rejoice we, for suffering. We don't rejoice at suffering. At suffering, right. We rejoice in So it. it's like, yeah. it, it it's almost like for... If, if you're in a position where you're able to acknowledge it, then suffering in certain situations is like a non-voluntary extreme fast <laughs> where something uncomfortable <laughs> is happening to you. And as a result, you can grow from that and possibly grow closer to God as a result. Uh, but it doesn't make it any better or fun. <laughs> like, I don't want it. Well, yeah. But it, it pro it'll probably be good for me. Well, in Hebrew says that um, the son, Jesus, was, 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 was completed, was perfected by his suffering. Mm. That, that's a very hard verse to sometimes understand. Um, yeah. Especially when, when, when we think of the Greek word right, for perfect being like, God, but meaning be made complete. It makes a lot more sense that, that suffering was part of the the completion of, of his role, right? And if it's yeah. if that's true for Christ, how much more true for us? We're not him. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I thought of while we you guys were talking about that was like I'm just thinking about especially when we talk about like material possession as well is it feels like whoever wrote the book of Job didn't really care about him per on a personal level <laughs> uh, because experiencing all these things the book ends with him getting a whole bunch of stuff and his brothers and sisters come and give him a couple gold and silver rings uh, and then the author says and then he lived an old life and it's that's supposed to be the really good ending it's like 
Yeah, he was close to death, and he he called out for death. He wanted to be. He he didn't want to experience this pain and suffering anymore. He experienced intense suffering, uh, but then it it it's almost as if the author is trying to get us to think like, yeah, but then he got six thousand camels, so like it's fine. Like this is he was given everything he had before plus all the stuff, uh, but then the subjectivity of the suffering comes into it, and like if, I mean, yeah, it becomes a really difficult situation where I don't like I'm reading the end of Job and I'm like this this sucks <laughs> like this feels like if I were Job it'd be like no this isn't gonna do anything for me I want my family back like you can't just bring me stuff and like that's not gonna like yeah he had he he had more kids and he like the author even especially emphasizes that um, his daughters were the most beautiful in the land it's like that's still that's not gonna do anything like, that's not going to bring my family back. You're like, it's not going to take away this traumatic experience that's going to shape him for the rest of his life kind of thing. Um, yeah. yeah and, and, like, like and yeah. that's said as a very, a very uh, intelligent Westerner. I, I think this is something that we have to realize about the book of Job. Is yeah. Job is unique because it is a book of suffering, obviously. But the, the way that, that it works out is it's a complete disintegration of shalom. So if you go through the first little bit of Job's suffering and you see what, what the accuser, who we've typically said is the devil, but actually no reason to think that it was specifically Satan, but this, this accuser of, God, of the people comes to God and asks for all these things and he begins breaking down creation. What, what we, you actually see is you see a reversal of the covenant blessings of Deuteronomy. You see... Um, essentially, this faithful guy experiencing the curses of disobeying the covenant, of all the blessings being reversed, health being right. taken away, and family being taken away, and land, and, and all these different things. So, like, you need to think about it as cosmic disintegration of the blessing of God. So then, when all those things get restored, land, family, money, whatever, it's a it is this cosmic reintegration of those blessings, which again, this is something that a lot of Christians have a hard time with, is the old covenant was heavily materialistic because mm -hmm. that was the revelation of the yeah, time, right? The land was the blessing. The family was the blessing. The beautiful daughters would have been the blessing because yeah, it would have meant life. Value. It would have meant lineage. It would have meant prosperity, right? right? And so, so yes, for us who like, who literally idolize family in the West, one child dying and another one coming obviously doesn't replace the, like the child of course not but like we we wouldn't make sense of that in, in any way but if you put it in in this ancient near eastern culture where families lineage and tied to your name and blah 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 you could see how it it, it it it's a kind of reversal of the reversal i agree with you it's not necessarily emotionally satisfying for us today when we have different idols and different ways of blessings and even new covenant right where we see it as more of a uh, of a less material Thing. And, and the funny thing about Job is people use that this exact thing as, a, as an excuse for prosperity, right? Because look what God did for Job. He got all the stuff back and more and blah, 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 right? And, and you know what? Potentially, if anyone, you know, has the accuser come and do all that stuff to them, maybe God will restore them like that again. I have no idea. I'm not I'm not the Lord. But I think we have to put it in the ark, right? It's an epic poem of of you see the reversal of, of creation itself. Like literally, you have to think about it cosmic. Like it, it was, it represents in that sense, the absolute like devolution of God's shalom, man's life. And then the, the journey, right, of, of that and going before the Lord and being called out and, and all those different things. And then the restoration. So, so there is a restoration there. And here's the thing. As Christians, we don't necessarily deny the fact that God cannot restore material things. That God can't bring back what the devil stole and blah, 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 blah. All those lines that, that we say. But I do think that, um, yeah, we have to be careful not to... Um, we have to be careful to read it as ancient Near Eastern would would read it not 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 as a western person i think that is a very key thing with with the book of job specifically well with the whole bible but in this regard that's how i would say because like when i when you begin to learn about the the framework of it some of it makes more sense though maybe still emotionally not great for us but it's like okay i can see yeah. i can see the arc here right and 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 the message of god's restoration and redemption 
and 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 I, I, I still believe that right and and yeah so I, I i don't think we should use it as the as the very basis of god's restorative material power for those who have gone through seasons in the dark or whatever the preachers will say but you know job job was true was this is this very unique epic poem that describes a very unique situation of complete cosmic collapse the blessings of right. god but that's how I would think about that. Personally. Yeah, I don't think right, I Mike. like. I wasn't trying to. I, Go ahead, sorry, I, I, I wasn't trying to set it up as like, oh, what the heck, God? Why didn't you like give him something better or like bring him back what he had? But I like. I think it's just. It was more like I'm sharing. Like this is as my reading it, and especially as someone in the Western world today who has, who is surrounded by things and things that are easy and i like like um it's not as yeah like we're all we're talking about a time like you said like kids are lineage and your name is being carried on but also kids are also livelihood like people who can work the fields like there's a very different like that's life it's not even like oh nice i have a kid who i can love and i can raise it's like i need this kid to continue my family or I will lose all value. So like, yeah, like I understand, I, I definitely understand that. And I definitely understand like we, we have to read it within its context. Um, I haven't heard it in the way that you were explaining there as like a, the reverse um, covenant, which is sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I learned that from, from my professor, David Beldman. He's a really wise kind of wisdom literature, Old Testament guy. If you ever want to look up a scholar, David Beldman, great guy. Yeah. Yeah. I had something else to say, but yeah, I feel like, yeah, I think I was just like, in the way that I think about, even as a poem, even if, like, yeah, it, the way I'm reading it as a Westerner doesn't feel good. Like, it's like, it's in the same way of most other things. It doesn't feel good, but it doesn't make it any less, like, um, like the song with everything from Hillsong is a, I don't like hearing it. It makes me feel bad, but it like I can still learn something. But from it's from still it. an amazing song. It's still song, a good message in there. Still... But it's but it's still a trash song, yeah, get... and it doesn't. It no one likes it. So, um, yeah. before uh, we actually, I was thinking about that, and I had forgotten. We do need to get Mike's opinion on a few worship songs that we talked about last week. But before we get to that, still going off this with Job specifically. I mean, I've always loved like god's response at the end yeah I, i'd never had heard what you said i really like that about uh about the covenant but i i, I always kind of took job as like it's not supposed to be like this really satisfying answer like god gives a big speech of being like i am god like i am in control and essentially like who are you to i don't know like mm -hmm. uh say Brace yourself like yeah. a man. Uh, uh, who, who would you discredit my yeah, justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Um. No, you're right. Job is not necessarily meant to be clean, bow, wrap it, and put together. Um, because it is this weird story. But in God, God's response, I think, is very anti-Western. Who do you yeah. think you are? <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah. I didn't know that I needed to hear that in my suffering. But I think, I think we actually do. Because a lot of times, mm -hmm. um, we tend to blame God, right? Emotionally. It's his fault. He's like, you weren't here when I made the world. Like, you, 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 you don't see the beginning from the end. You, you don't know how this, like, so I, there is, a, there is a, again, a humility that must mm -hmm. be in our human approach. Mm -hmm. And even when that happens, right, the whirlwind shows up and... And God's like, answer me, you. Yeah, like, if you're going to have a problem, like, I'm here now, right? And and there's this term, I can't remember what theologian talked about it, but the idea of, of recognizing our creatureliness before the Lord. And that moment, that's really what begins to happen. Job begins to realize, oh, shoot, like, I am the creature. I am the creation of this being. And that matters. That 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 matters. And... Yes, God is not going to literally show up in a whirlwind for all of our suffering. Um, but the beautiful thing about it 
is now we have Holy Spirit, right? Who is the wind of God, right? Who is the present whirlwind in that sense, who's with us, who does meet us in our suffering. And, and not necessarily with the whole, you know, who do you think you are, but like, here's who I am. And here's what I'm going to do with you. And here's how I can take this. And, and that's where the good can come. And so I think it, it is an interesting way to, to bring the Old Testament now into, in, into the new. But here's what, here, here's what I, I think like suffering is, is one of those conversations that we could literally pull apart for. We will be pulling apart for a whole life, mm-hmm. asking the same questions over and over again. And, and, you know, oftentimes we always want to begin in why, but really it should be um, how. Right? How do I move forward in this? How do I glorify God in this? How do I see the good in this? How do I grow in this? How do how do how is God at work here? How is He redeeming this? How is this going to be used for someone else's good? Because I've suffered, so they don't have to. What are lessons I get to share? What 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 is the comfort that I can give? Because um, I can now comfort in a way that I couldn't have a season ago. And, and I think if we can do that, we we will become wiser as human beings. Um, and, and so that that is a big thing that I would say. I'd I also say this. I think, um, you know, if you do want to talk about worship songs quick, that will be good. Um, I will need to jump off soon. Um, yeah. We've been going now for like two hours, guys. Yeah. This has been a great conversation. Um, what we will do, I will do it again, of course. I went by way faster than I expected. So, um, and, and I'd rather leave it kind of as a dot, dot, dot. So the next time we come back, there's like some, there, there's some cliffhangers. Um, Sounds good. But if you want to give me your, 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 your worship hot takes, then, then I'll give you, my, um, I'll give you mine. Also, we have in the chat, uh, a roommate of ours says that you kind of remind him of Jesus in a hoodie. So that's, uh, I think, take that, take as, a, take to, that as a compliment. Mike, taking, taking looking like Jesus really literally. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to live a life that looks like Jesus. So. Um, how many, uh, I do. Just, just. How many different fabrics are you wearing, Mike? That's the question. <laughs> Uh, His camera turns unknown, off. Unknown. He <laughs> 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 <Hey>, leaves. <laughs> Go on, I'm out. So just just Go a on. few quick opinions. So last week we did a big worship uh, tier list type thing where we each put forward five songs. We had Leah supplement with six bonus ones. Brought it up to twenty five because there was a one that was submitted twice between us. So we had twenty five songs. We all ranked them, and then I did the math, put it all together, and threw a big list. And there was a lot of disagreement on a few songs. So. First off, I, I want to get your opinion on this. I scored every song that we have done for worship, that our beautiful worship leader has chosen to lead in worship. And we actually had some pretty low scores from a few, uh, few people in the chat. Mr. Samuel in particular has some <laughs> strong words against wanna, uh, a few of the songs. I just um, want to point okay. out that I won. Also, Brad did win. Everyone liked his songs the best Brad in the end. won worship music. <laughs> But uh, what were first of all? Winner. What do you think out of these three songs? Which one do you think came out on top? Okay. All hail King Jesus, Christ be magnified, mm-hmm. Oh come to the altar. Mm-hmm. Which one do you think came out as number one? I would say all hail. See, I would say that too. But like, it was Oh come to the altar. Or you <laughs> Seriously, what are you guys oh, doing? Oh come to the altar. It's because we oh, all. Lovely. Ge- like genuinely like had it decently high literally no other song there was any agreement on other than lead me to the cross we all had around nine or ten <laughs> we all agreed that that is a lead me to the cross by Hillsong is a decent song so middle of the road I mean, song all hail king we jesus also, came in yeah, second we also, all agreed, we also <laughs> all agreed that waymaker is a very basic song but we still sing it but we week. love it <laughs> i yeah um it's all hail song. brad and i were all about all hail sam and josh had it pretty low there was big here's another very big one have you heard the song with everything by hillsong that was previously mentioned back in the day it's a classic one back in the day, yeah. so there was two songs that were ranked very highly and very lowly between two people with everything was one of them where someone had it insanely high someone had it insanely low and the other one was holy water which we led at the church a few few months ago. Someone had it as number one, and someone had that one as number five or twenty five. So thoughts on thoughts on those two songs? Um. Okay. Well, number one, it'd be interesting not for Careful tonight, now. but we'll we'll 
we'll work on it. Um, what was the theology behind the ranking? Because that would be an interesting conversation for me to hear. Yeah, um, we we all kind of came into it with we we talked about that at the start of like what we all kind of thought, but because like for this present theological moment, like, all hail is is. Is a is a prime song Thank for the you. for the for, for yeah. the declarative voice of the church. Thank but you. um, besides the point, um, with everything, with, with everything, um, is it, I I love I, like back in the day, it, it, it was it was fine. I wouldn't I wouldn't rank it high anymore because I think there's you don't have to go songs. soft, man. And then holy <laughs> water. Oh, holy, holy, holy water is not my favorite, <laughs> at least stylistically. It's like it just doesn't seem to jive with uh, with what I desire to do in worship. Um, it was a good shakeup. I'm glad the band did it. Yeah. Um, it's very evocative in its imagery, so you know we'll take it. But if I I would not have it top ten, I probably probably wouldn't have it top fifteen. Hmm. Slow down. So, down. You're, you're being a lot More kinder. Than top you're being a lot kinder than you were we were. You wouldn't have it in top ten. Okay, let's let's, let's stop at that. Okay, okay. I think I think those. I think, I think those were the main contentious ones that uh, that we had. So it's good to okay. good to get some clarity. I'm glad you uh, you're on the all hail train. Thank you, thank you. Um. Revel- much, yeah. Actually, I, I kind, kind of a wild card. Revelation song still came up real high. A very, Ooh. very old school, but that one, uh, that one still made the top ten. One time, my <laughs> one time I heard an interview on that one, and they were saying that we'll be singing that one in a hundred years. People think, think highly of that one. I think I was the only one that was um, meh on it. Revelation song. I, I think to, Revelation song is one of those ones that you have to do at a throwback night. <laughs> because it's gonna make revelation song for a generation for a few I, and i think it'd be like my age a little bit older than me will become one of those hymns that like the seniors at church right now <laughs> always want to have because it just it just does something in their heart and meets them somewhere because like yeah. that's like youth group camp all that stuff just like going off right when you hear revelation song and like your hands are in the you're like just crying or like you know, um, or, or what's like what's the one the the, the other one is like, um, this is the air I breathe. It's called breathe, right? Mm-hmm. This is the air I breathe. Your Holy Spirit, whatever that I one. Me, that that's They're like something it. at the altar, <laughs> like weeping. So like whenever that one comes on, like it's just like I'm desperate, Jesus, just more, yeah. just take it, right? So it's gonna be one of those ones for yeah. sure. Feel that. Also, one final thing: Oh, the cross. Thoughts on that song, real quick. Oh, the cross. Like, oh, the cross, what you've done. Yeah. I, I, well, like, it's hard to deny the beautiful nature of the song. It's, it's like a beautiful declaration of the gospel. I kind of like it because it, it is more, uh, if I'm remembering all the lyrics to it, I kind of like it because it's a little more evocative. The blood and very, the wine. Yeah, very communion. I think churches yeah. are so afraid to, like, that yeah, good. churches are afraid to sing those songs today. Mm-hmm. Like, there's even some churches that like, like specifically say you can't sing songs with blood in it and things. I think that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So, like, I kind of like it for that evocativeness, to be honest. So, unfortunately, that one ranked twenty fifth, <laughs> but a big part of it was the version that <laughs> Leah was a heathen. Leah Leah chose a version You're for heathen. it where the singer just really isn't giving it. If if it was Leah's version, I yeah. think we all would have. Giving it a much better uh, ranking. He is anointed, but yes, she, she is. She is quite anointed. So, but well, we'll definitely have. Unfortunately, we couldn't have Leah on last week because she was, she was working. But we're definitely gonna have more worship talk in the future. Um, but we will let you go. Thank you so much for for joining us. We will have me, guys. We will do more That's things great. in the future. We'll uh, we'll try and get mm. chat to toss us different topics and stuff. Um, yeah, thank you so much for for giving your cool. wisdom tonight and Thanks for having me. Sharon, we'll uh, we'll keep the link to uh, I guess this past sermon, and we can toss the link to the the sermon that we were referring to a lot from two weeks ago as well. Um, but yeah, for people in the chat, this is the pastor of our church, Pastor Mike. 
We're happy to have him on. Uh, let's 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 give it up. Thanks, guys. Let's give it up. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah, we're gonna we're gonna head to a little break Lord, Mike. we'll be back we'll be back in five to ten minutes so we'll see you guys in a little bit <laughs> 